Well, welcome back to the Azure podcast. Uh, this is episode number 465 being recorded on the 28th of June 2023 with special guest Ramya Oroganti. I'm Sajid and on teams with me, uh, I have a special guest Ramya and of course uh, Evan from, our, from from the podcast crew is here as well. And we're going to talk to Ramya about a new new service that's available uh, in, uh, that her team has been working on on Azure. But before that, uh, let's talk about some news. Uh, Evan, I believe there was something you really wanted to get uh, sure. over to our listeners yeah. today. Yeah, there's actually two things that I want to talk about. One of them because it's it's a it's a really significant shift, um, and the other one is something that I've um, a, a number of folks on my team worked on. So I wanted to to make sure to highlight it. But the first one is so everybody should be aware of Service Health, and this is where we send our communications, on the communication channel in Azure for outages for you know action required notifications, all that kind of stuff. We um, just recently announced, and we'll include it in the show notes, but um, security um, updates that are necessary for your guest OS resources are now going to flow through that same channel, as well as general Azure security stuff. So basically, we've, we've pulled in all the security notifications that we have, and we're following that into the same exact channel that you get all your other Azure notifications. And while it's not a thing yet, I will just share, because I'm sure people will be thinking about this, is long you know down the road um, we are absolutely thinking about how do we bring the m365 comms into this same sort of it may not be this channel maybe some other centralized channel but we, we it doesn't make any sense in this day and age to have five different places to go to look for updates so we're trying to bring all that together um this is one step in that direction um the other thing that i want to talk about this is something this is the thing that my team some other folks on my team worked on but um in Azure, it's a really, I don't wanna say it's a common thing that happens every day, but on a regular basis, we do retire services, right? They're not being used. They've been replaced by some later version, whatever it is, there is a retirement life cycle for these. Historically, you would have to go, you know, troll the documentation and understand where it's going and, and you know, what that retirement is. You'd have to look at your, you know, sort of watch your comms and then keep up with what's going when. Um, the, the team's done some really good work with this new functionality called Azure, um, uh, I think advisor workbooks is what they're called. But basically what you can do with this workbook is you can now see all the pending retirements that have been communicated to you through the, um, the normal channels, but now you can see them in a single dashboard. Um, and we're actually working on sort of evolving that to show other scenarios as well, where we retire things like APIs and features as well as services, but this is the first pass. On that, and it's just a great central place to go see exactly what's going to go on. Because again, you don't want to be surprised by this stuff. And, and and these are all relevant to the services that you are using, right? When it shows you that I, information, or is it like okay, yeah, here's everything that's it, being retired? It, it, it's so it's a little bit mix of both. We're trying to get smarter about this to say, hey, we want to sort of target it so that it's only stuff that you care about and you use. Um, there are some things that we just sort of tell everybody because you might, you know, you might start using it and you weren't using it yesterday. Um, but we are trying to get smarter and smarter over time about, hey, if you're, if you're, for example, I'm trying to build out a model that says, if we can see you're using a particular API version, you know, some preview version from 2016, we can tell you're doing that. So we're going to tell you we're going to retire it. And we're going to tell you when we're going to turn it off. And we're going to not tell you if you're not using it because you don't care. But we're not quite sophisticated enough to that. But we are we're moving in that direction and trying to get much more targeted with these. And what I like about the early announcement you had about the service health was that is uh, more targeted to what you have, right? It, yes, it, it knows absolutely. what operating system you have, what absolutely. version you have, absolutely. and it's like, because that's always been a problem. You you read in the newspaper or in the, online about uh, you know, hey, here's uh, these are the CVs that were announced, and I'm like, do I have that? Uh, yes. <laughs> does that impact me? Exactly. You have no idea. <laughs> really. Yeah, exactly. And and some of this this is also going to cover like Azure level vulnerabilities, right? When we announce um, a CV for say Databricks or you know, storage, wherever those will flow through those channels as well. But yeah, it really becomes this central place to go find this, right? Because we recognize it's really hard for customers to parse through all these different sources and figure out what they have to do something about. Thank you. Thanks for those updates. Well, I think uh, that's it for the news uh, segment. So uh, let's move on to our special guest, Rami. Rami, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, uh, please uh, go thanks ahead and introduce you. yourself to our listeners uh, and uh, tell us what you do at Microsoft and what your passion is in the Azure space. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much for uh, having me here. Appreciate it. And uh, I'm Ramya Organti. I work as a PM with Azure Functions team. So my focus areas are enabling functions on Kubernetes based environments like Azure Container Apps, AKS. I also work on triggers such as Kafka, Event Hubs, RabbitMQ. Uh, and uh, this is OSS component that my team and I work. It's called Keda, which helps with scaling of containers based on the events generated at the target sources. So yeah, I'm super excited to be here uh, with you guys in the show. Yeah, I mean this. Uh, you know, uh, you mentioned functions uh, on on Kubernetes. I think that's uh, some, certainly something that I can relate to. I remember it was only a, a few years ago that we did run. Uh, uh, we wrote an, an app uh, using the functions uh, SDK, and we put it on uh, on um, on our AKS cluster together with Keda. But it was not easy, right? I mean, you have to like uh, write the app in a particular way and then the triggers, you got to configure them correctly and it's all done by yourself, right? The developer has to do all of that. There is no tooling when you're kind of rolling your own container with functions in it and trying to get it to work inside of AKS and wired up to Keda uh, and whatnot. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm just curious, like, you know, what what does this new experience look like uh, for, for bringing it all together? <clears throat> So uh, all the challenges and uh, you know uh, the tooling uh, experience that you've just mentioned has been addressed in this in this new offering. It's called Azure Functions for Microservices powered by Azure Container Apps. So this enables uh, developers to quickly build these event-driven cloud-native function apps, and users get this flexibility to run functions along with other microservices, APIs, uh, websites, or any container-hosted programs. So this has been launched in uh, public preview during uh, build in, in the month of May. Uh, and some of the key capabilities that this uh, offering uh, provides is uh, it comes with uh, Azure Functions integrated programming model. Uh, and uh, you could write uh, function apps with the triggers and bindings that comes out of the box, and users could pick the language of their choice, and they could integrate easily with other APIs, uh, which are written in uh, different programming languages as such, uh, because all of them are deployed into this uh, app environment that is powered by container apps, and it's again the underlying layer is AKS as such. Uh, and the promise of this uh, true cloud native experience is about managing all these cloud native apps with DevOps processes and tools. And this is already offered by Azure Functions as such. So you could use the same tools and management experience that you're already familiar with Azure Functions and uh, have those code to cloud experiences uh, with tools such as uh, GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps pipelines. And uh, I also touched upon, right, like uh, being able to uh, run function apps with other uh, APIs. So you could easily integrate uh, functions with multiple app types. For example, you could have a web app hosted on a container app and functions running on, on uh, functions for container apps and a uh, backend DB. So all of them could be hosted on containers. You could integrate them easily, build them, and deploy using these templates such as ARM or Bicep. So what, what, so, so you, you, I was going to ask a question about sort of how do I know which architecture to use, and then you 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 hurt my head a little bit more because you talked about functions on top of or no, you talked about uh, web apps on top of on top of functions on top of container apps. Like like when I look at I have a functions app or I have a workload that I'm trying to build. You know I've got app services that's out there. I've got um, container apps. I've got AKS itself. Like. How, how do I even think through all the complexity and decide what's the right one for my workload or app? Yeah, that's a that's a good good question. And in fact, we're getting this uh, uh, this questions asked a lot from customers as well. Given that there's so many services that are yeah. out there, uh, there's AKS, there's app service, there's function apps that is offered on public Azure function like uh, public Azure, um, and then we're kind of introducing this new hosting environment. So yeah, so uh, there are different patterns and requirements. It depends upon the patterns and requirements, yeah. right? Uh, let's say for example. Uh, uh, there is this microservices architecture. There are several uh, microservices that are there. Uh, and uh, imagine a situation where uh, you'll have to separately go and configure these microservices and app service. Uh, and then you need this event-driven programming. So you'll have to uh, separately configure this app in uh, functions, All Azure functions as such. Yeah. And then you have okay. this uh, container-based uh, microservice API that is hosted on API on AKS. So you'll have to configure them separately, 
each individual service has its own networking observability and security mm -hmm. that has to be done. Mm -hmm. So, so imagine the time and and the complexity you would undergo in yeah, kind of setting a ton of setting this up. There. Yeah, <clears throat> setting up setting them up individually, and then uh, you know working through all this uh, VNet complexity, the the networking complexity, and integrating them and making them work together. So all of that is something that we're trying to kind of bring them this into one hood that is uh, our oh. environment where uh, you could bring in the app of your choice and of any language and uh, deploy them into this unified app environment as such. Okay, so so if I enter, if I sort of sort of take what you said and 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 sort of restate it, it sounds like what by by layering container apps, what it gives me is the ability to put all these different application types that can live in containers. But I and I still and I simplify my infrastructure underneath it, my virtual networks, my you know connectivity, all that kind of stuff. And so I I sort of I I am I don't lose all the complexity because there is still some element of it. But I'm able to to sort of focus on my app piece and then let the infrastructure be separate. Versus the other models, I now have to manage both because there's app complexity and infrastructure in like each one of those variants as you pull them. Okay, that that makes a lot That's of sense. Then. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you know, one thing I'm trying to uh, wonder here is, you know, functions uh, originally from an architecture perspective was seen as this thing that you just call for a quick, you know, quick API call. It has some code that you run, right, and it goes away, right? It, it, that, that was the whole thing about serverless, right? That That's where functions came from. Uh, and now, like, I feel like, okay, the functions is not serverless anymore from at least from what you describe it, because you're running it in ACA. The, obviously, that's, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, that's infrastructure that's required. Ha, ha, explain to me, like, you know, uh, does functions work differently in ACA as it would, let's say, in the consumption model, right? Uh, current, uh, by, by default, if you use functions in the ideal consumption model where you pay, I, think, I guess just by the number of, I don't know, the number of calls or API calls, et cetera, that you're making. How is this different over here? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so functions uh, in 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 container apps environment could be uh, run in a serverless mode, uh, and it actually supports consumption plan, where uh, as as you know, functions is event driven. So, uh, and events are uh, triggered by uh, like the sources, right? Like there there could be multiple uh, sources, and there are messages or events that are landing, and based on these uh, messages that land into these sources, uh, the functions get triggered and execute. So that's so we're we're kind of providing that model here where uh, functions would be triggered and uh, when there are events and they scale as per the load increases uh, and users get to pay when when these containers are are being provisioned and scaled and they can scale back to zero as well. Uh, apart from this, uh, there is an option for the users to still. Uh, uh, you know, define like a replica min replica account as one, and and also have they have the option to run function containers always, and uh, uh, the benefit or you know the the benefit that the user gets is that uh, let's say for example uh, there is no events that are happening, uh, so this this replica is kind of in an inactive state, and users get to kind of. Uh, pay this idle pricing and whenever there are load or events that are happening the the replica be becomes active and it starts to process these events so that's when it goes to that active state and 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 then the actual consumption pricing starts so it sounds a I little see. bit like a hybrid between where you're you're not you're you're sort of serverless at some level but you lose some of the warm up and everything else that we see with traditional serverless and you're you're sort of a little bit right in the middle right on that edge between serverless and 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 not serverless and non serverless that, that's a great question so uh, like i said uh, if users wanted to be a pure serverless model uh, they could uh, not define this min replica account right. and uh, there's actually absolutely no functions running but yes so there would be these cold start problems and and it depends there are some applications that demand uh, very low cold start yeah. so in that yep. cases they 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 could uh, go with you know having this replica account as one or whatever the ideal uh, number it has the minimum count it has to be uh, and still uh, get uh, uh, they uh, get the advantage of the platform where you know they could have this go into this inactive state and active state and and uh, leverage the benefits of the platform. 
You know, the you know ACA, of course, we all know is uh, uh, the underpinning is AKS, right? Uh, like an AKS cluster, where you don't have to really worry about it. But I'm curious that uh, for the from the function triggering perspective, we talked about all the bindings triggers. We all know that there has to be some code somewhere sitting somewhere listening to all these triggers, right? And then waking up your function or waking up your container or whatever, whatever might be the case. I'm curious, uh, uh, yeah, and just more curiosity, and I'm not sure it really matters uh, to the to the end user, but where is that uh, code running? Is that running inside of this AKS cluster, or is it running in some common Microsoft infrastructure? You know, the code that is kind of watching for these events and then passing them on to this function. Yeah, th that's a great question. So the platform comes with these OSS components like Kada and Apple, and and Kada is 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 uh, actually helps with uh, scaling to zero and and uh, to dozens of containers. So it, it has the capability to kind of monitor uh, the target sources that gets configured for a function. So whenever there are events that are happening, so Kada is a component that will listen to these events and bring up the function container and execute them. And then once the load goes down or the events have completed, it scales them back, uh, back to zero. So she just said something that um, I, I think I missed the first time through um the the functions on containers runs on top of aks at the end of the day but i think i heard you mention web apps in there and web apps don't run on aks necessarily How, is this a is this the exact same web apps that we should be thinking about when we talk about app services and and public web apps can i can i deploy the exact same thing or is this some some variant that I have to do something differently as a as a user of web apps, or can I just take my standard web app that I would deploy to ASE or web apps and just deploy it here? Yeah, you could. Uh, so this is uh, so the web apps are uh, they could be containerized, right? Like you have this web app port, uh, and uh, and when you're actually containerizing them, uh, you bring in the runtime, the app server, and then the the code that is there, bundle them, containerize them into an image, and then this image can be provided as an input uh, to the container app, where it gotcha. it, it essentially uh, provisions this image and runs as a container in this app environment. Okay, uh, so so, you, so so I can deploy basically something I can deploy to app services. Or public yeah. web apps, I can deploy. I, like I don't have to make any changes on my side to to do it. Really, I might have to do a little bit from a deployment perspective, but I'm like my code doesn't have to change really to to do to deal with this other environment. Right. So in this, it's like DIY stuff. Like you're you're you'll have to manage your own uh, app server, the version that right. you need, your uh, the application demands. But whereas in the past service, it's it's the the app server is already there. All you're doing is just deploying. The code. Oh, okay. So I see what you're saying. So I, yeah. Okay. So I do pick up some infrastructure management, but I don't really have to change my code. But I do change my infrastructure piece. Okay. That that makes sense. I thought we were sort of going in this real. I was getting in this circle here, right? <laughs> I'm curious. Someone was said starting at the portal, the Azure portal, and you know, you type functions, and of course that's one of the options in the Azure portal. Now, when I click functions, uh, is there like a new option that's opened up to say, okay, I can help? because typically you would give it a plan, right? Uh, uh, an app service plan is the typical option that's available over there. Are we saying there's going to be another option now for ACA? How, uh, what's the user experience like from the portal? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we've kind of weaved in. Uh, so this is this is going to be a new hosting environment and a new plan that that's introduced into the the functions, uh, the existing functions, right? Like today, function supports consumption plan, elastic premium plan, and uh, app service environment, which is essentially the dedicated plan. So this is a new plan that's been introduced, uh, which is called as uh, uh, Azure Container Apps uh, Environment. And Azure Functions Client Tooling like Portal and CLI is enabled today with this plan. Um, so uh, you, the users are expected to provide this new uh, hosting environment. Uh, so that's where you're essentially telling functions that, hey, deploy my app into this hosting environment name. Uh, this is like uh, the user is expected to uh, pre-create it, uh, or like if 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 it is through portal, they could create it uh, while they are creating the function app, or if it is using uh, CLI, the expectation is that they create this environment and then give that as an input, uh, and and uh, for deploying this function app into this managed environment. Uh, and from a plan standpoint, uh, functions on container apps today supports consumption plan. Uh, and uh, the, uh, which is in GA for uh, container apps as such. Uh, 
There's also another new plan that's been introduced. It's called workload profile, which is again divided into consumption and it's it's like the new consumption veto and then dedicated. Uh, so functions do support uh, the new consumption veto as well. Uh, and dedicated is something that we're working on, which essentially provides this dedicated single tenant AKS cluster to the user uh, where they could run 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 functions or uh, apps uh, in a dedicated mode or in a single tenant. And 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 you know from a from a pricing perspective, uh, when typically when you run functions, you're essentially paying for the plan, right? Uh, I guess that you're running the functions on. Uh, is it the same here? You're just playing paying for the ACA uh, infrastructure instance, and then the functions is like uh, I don't know. Is there an additional cost for the functions itself? Yeah, right. So there's no extra charge uh, for Azure Functions on container apps as such. So function executions are built according to the container apps. Uh, and uh, yeah, so users can leverage uh, the active usage pricing and the idle usage pricing based on the replica accounts they define. And yeah, it's it's uh, like I said, it's it's the, the pricing is same as uh, container apps. Uh, there, there's a free tier. The first two million requests are are uh, within the free tier, and also like uh, one eighty k. We only get two million. <laughs> <laughs> and, and beyond that, is it's it's very. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's just like uh, less than a dollar for per million request as such. So it's very competitive uh, pricing as such uh, that has been introduced. I sorry, I just have to laugh because you know I, I I you know we I I've been on the hanging out on the Azure platform for a really long time now, and I you know I remember where you know literally everything you did cost a little bit of money to do it, and and now you know there's sort of these free tiers for a lot of the services, and some of the numbers we give. Like the number of event hub messages will process, or in this case, the request. Like they're just like you would, unless you're running a real app, you would never ever hit this stuff, right? Which is really democratizing across the board. So I'm I'm really happy to see that. It just makes me laugh when we throw, oh, you'll you know, if you exceed two million, you have to pay something. Okay. <laughs> um, what when um. <sighs> It sounds like when you were talking about the sort of the deployment and the capabilities of this, and you talked about the integration with CI/CD pipelines and whatnot. Do uh, you know? Yes, I'm I'm removing some of the infrastructure complexity, like we talked about earlier. Um, but I've got all these different app types that I can deploy to ACA, right? Um, am I gonna? Do I have the full range of capabilities that I would have with normal container apps in terms of the different types of apps that I can run, or? Or am I restricted to some smaller subset of capabilities or, or app types? So I base, I guess maybe state a different way. If I can deploy it to a container and it will run, can I mm -hmm. use it in sort of this world with, with, in combination with you know the function apps and the AKS or does that does that question make sense? Yeah, absolutely. You could uh, you could definitely uh, you know integrate uh, functions that are running on container apps with other uh, apps that are running on AKS or uh, Okay. You no know, other uh, past services as such, like your database service could be uh, uh, in uh, like SQL or Redis. Yep. Uh, okay. Because uh, containerized serverless database is something that uh, it's not out there yet, and and uh, there are other capabilities that have been worked on from a platform level to kind of give those sandboxes where customers could bring in their DB as a always running containerized. Uh, image that is being provisioned on app environment as such. But right. yes, to your question, uh, yeah, it, it, it can be uh, integrated with other uh, past services or uh, services running on VMs or Kubernetes. OK, so I'm not uh, restricted to sort of living just within this this container app. It's sort of environment. OK, that's great. Yeah. You know, as a as a as a developer, I mean, I use functions quite a bit. Uh, I have two kind of questions about that. One is you know, there's a lot of triggers available in functions. Right, uh, I mean, it's it's quite a big list actually. Uh, so uh, kind of uh, almost uh, similar to what Evan was asking. Are there, can we? Are there any limitation running this function now? This in ACA in terms of the trigger support, or is it like the full gamut of triggers uh, that we used to have? Like you know, if I was running on a um, uh, on app service today, and I was like, you know, hey, let's consolidate everything in our ACA infrastructure right? because it's all there. We don't want to have two plans. It's on one plan or whatever. And we kind of just I, I can just drop it here or move it here. Yeah, that, glad that you've asked that question. Um, so we've kind of uh, started off with uh, 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 like 
uh, some some triggers like HTTP, storage queue, service bus, event hub, and uh, Kafka. Uh, because uh, uh, like from our study, and we've kind of investigated on what are the like the popular ones that are predominantly used in microservices or uh, you know in a container based or a cloud native world. And we've kind of uh, uh, given this full fledged uh, integration with Keda where users need not uh, configure uh, for scaling uh, these uh, specific uh, trigger apps as such. Um, having said that, uh, functions on container apps to, uh, today supports all of all of the triggers that functions uh, provides out of the box. But from a scaling standpoint, the, the triggers that I've mentioned uh, would, would be like this auto scaling configuration that has been enabled. But for other uh, triggers outside of this list that I've mentioned, uh, users would have to like have a replica, a min replica to be one to be set because there's no Keda uh, scaling that has been enabled, and uh, mm. these such apps won't be scaled as such. So they would be run, they would be running uh, as per the number of replica accounts that the user given gives and uh, uh, process it. And there's always those spots uh, or containers uh, that are up and running. That up, but, yeah, that makes sense. But we are evolving, so this is going to change. And as we progress toward towards GA and beyond, uh, we are going to bring in more and more, uh, like m all of the triggers, uh, into into this list and make sure that uh, they have that seamless integration. They are seamlessly integrated with Keda. Yeah, so it's really it sounds like it's really more uh, about sort of expanding the capabilities of Keda than it is sort of the the container apps functions on a container apps environment that you have built. So you've got to do some work over sort of on the Keda side, but it, that's once you implement it there, it'll it'll just work just like it did natively, like Sajit was talking about. Yeah, exactly. So this is something it's very unique to functions on container apps because mm -hmm. like this is not something that users get when they deploy to AKS because right. or or they bring their own Kubernetes, right? So because they'll have to really configure, uh, they have to know Keda, they have to install Keda, they'll have to configure scaled objects for a specific trigger, and that's when things are integrated and they work. Uh, Yep. But but in container apps, uh, we've kind of uh, uh, taken that from the user and uh, we are kind of managing that. We've kind of understand what trigger that the user is trying to deploy and uh, configure the scaled objects accordingly and scale the function apps. Okay. Another thing that I've been using on functions is Golang, right? And I believe Golang and Rust fall in the category of not directly supported in functions, but you can do it using, I guess, uh, like a custom extension custom or something handles. like that. Custom yeah. handler. So is that also supported over here in AC, in uh, in the ACA thing? Uh, is there any, any kind of restriction there? Yeah, absolutely. Like users, uh, like we don't have a worker, like, like let's say for .NET or, La or Java or Python. So uh, functions has this component called a language worker. Uh, where the runtime is there, which supports uh, running these various uh, programming language function apps. Uh, but yes, like you said, Golang and uh, Rust is not uh, supported. Like there's no language worker component that is there. But yeah, using the custom handlers feature, users can uh, run these apps. And yes, this is supported in uh, container apps as well. I, the 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 uh, the X support engineer um, in me sort of. I hear I hear that statement and say, well, you it's not supported unless you do this custom extension. Like, do we really like do we can do we truly consider them supported or is it, hey, go try it if it works, that's awesome. But if it doesn't work, don't don't talk to us. I like because I think that matters to a lot of customers, right? Some people are really married to the language. Other customers are like, no, if it's not mainline support, I, I don't want to use it. Yeah, great question. So when I say supported, it's like it works. Uh, okay. I think I, I'm like uh, playing with, but it's not like because you're bringing your stuff and uh, you're uh, kind of uh, uh, deploying it onto functions. Yeah. So uh, it's not like uh, 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 Azure supported. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, it's not yeah. yeah at that point, it's almost like your own container, right? I mean, it's, yeah. you're running all your own stuff, exactly. booting it yourself. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Whatever that is. If that breaks, then there's not much support can do. Yep. Yeah, yeah, but that's I mean that that's sort of a key distinction, right? Because I mean there there are absolutely scenarios and workloads where you're willing to own that piece, right? You're you you know because you need it for some some functionality, um, you know. But there's other scenarios where you're like, hey, I don't care what language I'm using. I, like I just want to use something that no matter what I do, it's you know the platform sort of man you know handles it and can cover it. So I, I just wanted to make sure we understood that distinction. But no, thanks thanks for clarifying. 
Sounds like yeah, we're constantly doing weird stuff. <laughs> but we are constantly lo- uh, looking out for like what are those languages especially in right. this cloud native space right like golang is is like the most popular Huge. one and yeah. and yeah. yeah hopefully down the line uh, this is something that we're uh, going to work and bring the work out of it and yeah. uh, make it like an officially azure supported company another thing that uh, came to mind and i know we should wrap up soon here but observability of course is something that's always in the top of my mind uh, when it comes to uh, running anything in Azure. So uh, does that change that model? Does that change? Like if I've got my existing functions app, I'm writing a new one. Do I have to do anything different to get observability to work inside of ACA or it's just uh, business as usual there? Yes, so it's 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 the same. So uh, Azure Function supports uh, app insights and uh, so you could use the same, like from the experience and tooling standpoint, it's the same. So you could uh, enable app insights and uh, like the log analytics workspace, which is powering up this app insights that could be enabled and and all of your function logs flow into that app insights and you could uh, monitor your function apps, uh, monitor your, uh, like analyze your logs. Uh, and on top of that, there's this live metrics feature where you could actually see your function app scaling and, and yeah, all of that is like nothing changed uh, with respect to uh, the functions uh, observability story as such. Awesome. This is great. Uh, thank you so much, Rami, for explaining all this to us and uh, answering all our questions today. Is there anything else you wanted to leave with our listeners uh, before we wrap up here? No, yeah, I think great conversation, great questions. Uh, yeah, so this this is currently in public preview. We are actively working on bringing out new capabilities and I've touched upon some of them. Uh, so we are actually coming up with like seamless integration with Dapper. And Dapper seems to be like one of the, like, you know, the Kendall, key Kendall component. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, so we are missing her as well. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, that's going to be out soon. And uh, the private VNet capability, managed identity will follow. So, yeah, I would really urge the, you know, developers out there working in the cloud native space who have requirements to run this event-driven programming. Check out the service all the features that are available, give us feedback. I'll probably drop in the GitHub repo link in the show notes maybe. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah I'll, be love, I'll love to get the feedback, what worked, what didn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it, I guess. Awesome. Great, thank you, Ramya. Thanks so much. Thank you, thanks for having me, I appreciate it, yeah.